church, would y'all stand with us? We're going to worship the God this morning who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Come on, let's worship him together. Just one word, you come the storm that surrounds me. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of Him. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that makes a way there's nothing that our God can't do just one word you hear what's broken inside me just one word and you revive every dream just one touch I feel the Try 
see how you love me too much to let me stay lost. My salvation sent from heaven, nailing my sin to the cross. Oh, but
you're strong and I've witnessed it. You're constant, I've witnessed it. And I'm confident, I'll see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I've witnessed it. And I'm confident, I'll see it again and again. You're good and I've witnessed it. You're strong and I've witnessed it. You're constant, I've witnessed it. say will happen happens you've proven it over and over so father would you help us now in this moment for whatever situation is going on in our lives highs or lows whatever that we would trust you with everything there's no hope better than you there's nowhere else we can place our trust that will not disappoint. So we trust you this morning. We love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all be seated? If you are a middle schooler, including incoming fifth graders, you're dismissed to go to the loft. Is this thing working? There we go. Good morning, church. How are we doing? Oh, love it. Okay. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Brad. I am the student pastor around here, and these things are going to fall if I'm not careful. All right. Put these down real fast. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody here, everybody online. Um, we are super excited, uh, super excited just to be here speaking to you guys. So if you guys could open up your Bible, we're going to jump right in really quickly this morning. Um, open up your Bibles to Psalms 27. It's where we're going to be living. Um, now you might be wondering... Why, Brad, the youth pastor, why are you bringing skis? 
Um, so we got a little bit of a Christmas in July. I just thought, you know, with school starting back up, and our students are super excited about it, um, <laughs> that we'd get ready for winter. Okay, maybe not, but there, there's a story there, and we're going to get there in a quick second. But for this morning, I want us to take inventory, all right? And that's kind of the, the title of our message today, is taking inventory. And what I mean by this this morning is I want us to really ask some deep questions. I want us to ask some deep questions. I want us to really seek after God. And I want us to kind of get to the roots of what we believe and why we believe it. So this morning, I have three questions for you guys. And you'll see on your notes, I made it kind of uh, precipitatory. Um, so make sure to kind of keep up, write in. I have some questions and answers for you on the notes. Feel free to keep up with us. It's going to be great. Uh, but the three questions we're going to be asking this morning is first, where is your confidence? Where is your confidence? Second question is, who is your God? And the third question is, how strong are the foundations of your life? Now, I want to encourage you guys, before we jump into these questions, that I think it's very easy, especially for us in a church setting, to kind of answer these questions maybe a little too quickly. And we're like, oh, we know the answers that we're supposed to, what we're supposed to say. But I want us to truly kind of just think through and reflect and say, hey, God, is this true about my life? Do I actually believe this or am I just saying it outwardly? And I want us to kind of get down to the roots, like I said, of what we believe and why we believe it. So I figured the best way to do this is to start off with a message about skiing. So I don't know who here has ever gone skiing before. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, I'm from Michigan, so you might think like skiing, snowboarding, all things snow, making snowmen, hockey, that might just be right in my wheelhouse. Guys, to be honest, I, I hate winter. I should have moved farther south when I came down here. Should have gone farther. I didn't. Um, and so I wasn't 18, I was probably 18 or 19 the first time I actually went skiing, and so my parents took me and my brothers uh, up to a place called Caberfay, which is on the west side of Michigan, I and mean, we went skiing for the first time. Now, when you go skiing for the first time, there are some things they, they try to teach you, they try to get you in slowly, get you comfortable, make sure you know what you're doing, gain some confidence. Um, and so when you first get to a skiing slope, what they do is they fit you for your skis, get your helmet, make sure you stay safe. Um, and then they take you out, and they take you out on these things called bunny hills. Real demeaning. All right, it's not something you want to feel confident in. There's nobody's going around and like, yeah, I'm the best at bunny hills, you know. But that's how, that's how they start you. So they start you off in bunny hills, and you're going along, and you're, and you're growing in confidence. And we're going to see if some of you guys who have been skiing know this. Uh, they try to teach you two different methods of skiing, all right. So the first one is when you're going right up like this. All right, this is called French fry. All right, this is when you're all about speed. Right, you're all about getting down the mountain, getting down the slope as fast as possible. This is where you live. And as me, as a teenager who is also a very competitive person, this is where I was living. All right, yeah, I'm like, yes, French fry, got to beat my brothers. I'm going to be the best, yada, yada. Um, then they also teach you another method. Anyone know what this is? Pizza. You guys are awesome. If we were in middle school right now, I would throw candy to you. This is great. Yeah. No. But this is how you're supposed to slow down. And so French fry and pizza, and that's... That's where you're supposed to live. Um, unfortunately, after a couple runs, me and my brothers were like, hey, we're getting this down. We don't need to stay on these dumb bunny hills anymore. Let's go up to the next one. So we went to the next one, the next uh, slope, and we were feeling pretty good about it. Still pizza, mostly French frying. And then we're like, you think you're ready for a black diamond? <laughs> we're like, yeah, we're ready for a black diamond. For those of you guys who don't know, black diamonds and double black diamonds are the hardest ski slopes on a course. And so after maybe, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, I think it was like four, maybe four runs, we decided we're ready for a black diamond. You can imagine this story is not going to go over well. So we get to the top of this hill, and here's the thing. French fry, and in particular pizza, pizza works when you're going five miles an hour on a bunny hill. Pizza does not work when you are on a black diamond. I don't care how much you're trying, you are French frying it down there. <laughs> that is where you're going to live. And so we're like, we're trying to pizza, we're not pizzing. And we're making our way down the hill and just out of control, completely out of control. 
and moving past people, getting down the hill fast, but fearing for our very lives. All right, we are passing skier, snowboarder alike. I get down to the bottom of the hill, somehow by the grace of God, actually survive. My older brother was not as lucky. Um, he gets down to the bottom of the hill, and he just eats it. All right, just face first in the snow. Somehow he ripped his jeans doing something, which, P.S., if you're wearing jeans, you're probably not ready for a black diamond. <laughs> just saying. But that's my skiing story. <laughs> So I'm going to put these down real fast. But I think this illustrates this idea of kind of where we're going at this morning uh, in Psalms 27. Because, you see, the thing is, I was so confident. Me and my brothers, we were so confident. We were so confident, and we had little to no ability to really back up our confidence. Um, you know, I could go fast. I could go fast. I could get down the hill really quickly. I could race my brothers. I could maybe even win. But in order to do so... I had to be completely out of control, and I was reckless and a risk to myself and also those around me. Now, the thing is, I don't think that sounds too different than some of the, some of the days in our lives. I think sometimes that sounds like my life, where I'm rushing, I'm out of control, trembling, really hoping I make it down the hill, fearing that if I make one small error, I'm going to just go face first full of snow, and rip my jeans. And I wonder if sometimes that describes your life too. And so in our psalm today, we're going to be talking about Psalm 27. And in Psalm 27, is all about confidence. And it's all about confidence in God amidst everything that might be happening in life. And so this is a story of, from King David. And King David, for those of you guys who maybe are unfamiliar with King David, King David is somebody that was always kind of dealing with something. Whether it be wars, battles, people talking ill of him, just different things. He was, he was always, always facing something. And even before he was king, he was a man who just was constantly in battle and constantly in war. And yet, despite this, he had confidence in God. So, we're going to jump in here. But before we do that, I wanted to just be okay for this morning with slowing down. Let's get off the black diamonds of life. Let's be okay with the bunny hills. I know it's a little demeaning. It's all right. It's okay. But let's just start there, and let's pray, and let's get into it. All right. Uh, dear God, Lord, it's thank you. God, I thank you, Lord, that you are always there for us. That, Lord, it doesn't matter how far we fall. Lord, you're always near. It doesn't matter how far we run away. God, you always come after us. And God, I just pray today as we talk about confidence and we talk about just who you are, that God, that we would really want to be a people that just run after you because you ran after us. So God, I pray, Lord, you would just enlighten us to this, open our ears, open our eyes so that we might hear your truth. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just be our confidence. Amen. So. We start off in Psalms 27, and Psalms 27 starts off with this verse. So think of it, just amidst all this stuff, amidst war, amidst rumors of war, fear, this is how David responds in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? This is how David responds. In the midst of fear, in the midst of the unknown, and we don't know exactly what he's going through in this psalm, but he's going through something, and he says, hey, I'm going to have confidence in God. I can be bold because I know who is behind me. I know who's on my side. And he says some unique things. He says, first of all, he says, God is my light. He knows that we serve a God that is a revealing God. A God that reveals secrets, that reveals mysteries, that reveals light in the darkness. That's the type of God we serve. But he also says, not only that, he is my salvation. You see, David knew that all the victories he had won, whether it be battles, wars, political enemies, whatever it was, he knew that the true victor, the true power was in God himself. And then he says, hey, God is also, he's my stronghold. I can trust in him. I can rely on him. When I don't feel enough, he's enough. And he's like, if God is all these things, who in the world do I have to be afraid of? 
Whom shall I be afraid? What shall I be afraid of? And you know, and David had a bunch of experience to back up this confidence, right? We think of David and Goliath, a very famous story, right? David comes in with a sling and a stone, and he conquers a nine-foot giant. You might also know of all the times David had to escape the previous king of Israel, King Saul, when King Saul was trying to kill him. And throughout his life, again, 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 and again, David had seen God come through. And because of that, he can now say, who in the world shall I fear? Who can come up against me? And so church, the first inventory question I have for you this morning is where is your confidence? What is your confidence in? And in particular, in times of trouble, where do you turn to? Because it's really easy in the midst of, of nothing going on to be like, oh yeah, I have confidence in God. But in times of stress, in those particular times, what happens to you? Where, where, do, where do you turn to? Right? Maybe some of you guys, maybe you turn to work and you're thinking, hey, I'm just going to work my way out of this. I'm going to work super hard and I'm going to get it and I'm just going to finish it. Maybe you turn to intelligence and maybe you're like, hey, I can, I can outsmart this problem. I don't know what the problem is, but I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure out the puzzle. I'm going to outsmart it. Maybe it's manipulation. Maybe you're like, hey, you know, I can kind of kind of figure this out. I can twist it around. I can make it fit my will. I can control this situation. Maybe you're just going to brute, just use brute strength and just work your way out of it. Maybe you're like, hey, I can talk my way through this thing. Maybe we just throw money at it. And you guys will see on your note sheet, I wrote down several of these different ideas. I just want to just be real with you guys. And this is something I know I really value is just, just being real. Because I think we, we all struggle with these in different moments. But which one in your life do you find yourself turning to most often? All right, I just want you guys just to circle that. And if you don't know, I encourage you, ask your wife, husband, fiance, significant other, and they'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, which one of these things do you tend to turn to? You know, uh, last week we had been in a middle school with middle schoolers. We had been up in Minnesota. We were on a middle school missions trip, and it went over great. It was fantastic. But we get back on Sunday, and I'm like, am I preaching next week? And then Eric's like, Brad's teaching next week. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and we get to Tuesday, and in Tuesday we, we review all of the missions trip, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, and then Wednesday I'm like, I got to get writing. And I'll be honest, because I am stressed. I'm stressed. I'm working through. I'm like, I got to get this stuff done, yada, yada, yada. I'm trying to think of everything else that's to get done. I'm like, I have to meet with my, my student leaders still. I have to try to fix up the loft. We have to write curriculum for the fall. I have all these ideas, and I'm just like, ah, I'm just kind of freaking out. And in the midst of this, I felt like God kind of like slowed me down and said, Brad, you're talking literally about confidence here. Where in the world is your confidence? You're literally preaching my word. And I'm like, oh, yeah. You got a point there, God. And I think the question is, and sometimes I think in your lives as well, is sometimes are, are we willing to actually let God be God? Or are we saying, you know what, I'm going to rely on myself, I'm going to figure it out. Are we willing to actually admit that sometimes we have weaknesses and we need God to be our strength? Maybe sometimes we want to ride down the black diamonds of life and God's asking us to ride down the bunny hills because that's where we meet him. And I don't think my experience of turning to work as an escape is probably that unique. How many times do we just, yeah, put our skis down, aim down the slope, thinking we can pizza our way through it, and we're like, nope, you're French frying it. And we struggle. And I have this quote that I think is really telling uh, just about this type of lifestyle, and it comes from Jared Wilson, who's an author, and actually... He's quoting this on Psalms 27. He says this. He says, whenever we rush frantically about trying to do it on our own, we in effect become functional atheists. We in effect become functional atheists. Ouch. How can it be, guys, that we are willing to trust God with our eternity, we're willing to trust him with our salvation, and yet so often it is so much more difficult to trust him with our day-to-day? -day? Why is that? So, guys, I asked the question again this morning, where is your confidence? What do you turn to? 
And in those moments where you get super stressed, what's your first, what's the first thing you go to? Where is your confidence at? And I would encourage you to be like David to put your confidence rather in God. Put your confidence in God, the one who was actually in control, and the one who cares for you, and the one who is your light, your salvation, and your stronghold. So like I said, last week we were up in Minnesota, and I think I have a picture up here of our Minnesota team. We got a picture right up here? I think we do. There we go. There's our team. Uh, I'm behind the camera. If you're wondering what's going on in the photo, I'm not exactly sure. Um, this is us trying to be cool and maybe being a little more weird, but that's all right. Um, we were having a fun time. But this was our team. And while we were up there, we got to interact with a local Alliance church and partner with them. We put on a soccer VBS for a local community, even though most of us hadn't really played soccer before. Um, and then we also did like a community garden work one day. We went and did some park ministry where we just kind of built relationships with people. And we're trying to be Jesus, Jesus to them. But one thing you got to know just about Minneapolis and the Twin Cities area is it is a very diverse melting pot. There are a bunch of refugees, first generation Americans that call the Twin Cities home. And it was a privilege and a blessing to actually be able to come alongside them and just kind of just be able to witness other believers in other contexts and be able to meet other people that we might not normally have not normally meet. But I think whenever I come back from a context like that, I always ask myself questions because there are different people not only of different backgrounds but also of different faiths who also believe different things about God if they believe God at all. And I think sometimes I come back from that trip and I say, hey, why do I believe in Jesus? Why do I believe that he is the way? Why do I believe that he is the my Lord, why do I believe that he's going to come back? Why do I believe this? And, you know, sometimes it's slandered against Christians that we're just a product of our environment. That, hey, you grew up in a Christian household, yeah, you're going to be Christian. But I think it's, it's got to be more than that. You know, Psalms 34 talks about this idea of tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. There's an actual, there's a, there's a knowing there is a knowing element to know God. And maybe right now, maybe you're in here in this room and you have some questions. You'll see on your note sheet, there's a little space for you. And I would encourage you, if you got a question, just write it out. Right, and maybe, maybe the next step for you is maybe the next time that we offer the worldview class, maybe it's taking that class and saying, you know what, I need to get down into the roots to figure out what I actually believe and why I believe it. Maybe it's doing what we're just saying here on the note sheet, is just writing out the question and saying, hey, I need to get an answer to this. Maybe it's just admitting that sometimes we have questions and doubts. And that's okay. What I want you to know is that God is big enough to deal with them. He's big enough to deal with our struggles, to deal with our doubts, to deal with the unknowns, and that we can serve a God who is the light that reveals things. And so my second inventory question, based on this kind of idea, is who, or we'll say slash what, is your God? Because you see, David, David knew God. Yes, he had experience, totally. But David, he knew God personally. He knew God intimately. And this is what he says about it in kind of in verse 4. This is what he says. He says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. I mean, what a picture of devotion, of commitment, of just wanting to be in the presence of God. And yes, David had experience, but I wonder how much his confidence was based on his experience, but how much more might it have been based just on the idea that he was with and within the presence of God on a continual basis. A.W. Tozer, a famous alliance pastor, he said this just about our understanding of who God is. He says, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. 
Well, you think about God as the most important thing about you because really, at the end of the day, that's all that really matters is God. And, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a conversation uh, with a student, former student, uh, and he was kind of just going through this. And he's saying, you know, I've grown up uh, in a church. I've grown up with godly parents. I don't really know why I believe what I believe. And his cousin actually challenged him on it. It's like, hey, why in the world do you believe in Jesus? And he had to get to the point of saying, you know, I, I, I don't really know. And my fear is that there might be people in the room that if I were to ask you the same question, why you believe in Jesus, you might say, I don't know, just, I do. It's what I've always done. And my fear is that if we were to get to heaven and we would say, we'd go up to Jesus and we'd say, hey, Jesus, I did all these things for you. I came to church every Sunday for you. I volunteered every Sunday. I gave offerings every Sunday. Yet one of the scariest verses in the Bible is where Jesus says, I don't know you. Our faith has to be deeper than that. It has to be deeper than routine. It has to be deeper than just go with the flow. It's got to be deeper than I'm a good person because, let's be honest, the very idea of salvation is realizing we're not good people, and that's why we need Jesus in the first place. Our faith has to be based on the person and the presence of God and knowing him and accepting his son as our Lord and Savior who came to die and rose again from death that we might have life. It's got to be based on that. And you know, and I could give you guys, I could give you manuscript evidence, I could give you eyewitness accounts, I could give you maybe logical philosophy to back up our faith, because I don't believe our faith is just blind, but also our faith is not just a logical next step. It's a relationship with the living God. David knew God because he spent time in his presence. He spent time in Scripture knowing who God revealed himself to be. And sometimes we exchange the God of the Bible for different gods. Right? And I'm not saying like different religious gods. I'm just saying sometimes we, we switch up some of the characteristics of God himself. Sometimes we believe more in a distant God. We say, oh yeah, God created the world, sure, sure, sure. He, he died for me, awesome. But he doesn't really care about my day to day. Sometimes we exchange the God of the Bible for that God. Sometimes we go with the God that says, hey, God just wants me to be happy. How's your confidence working when you're not happy? Sometimes we exchange God for an angry God. And we just believe that we're constantly in, in this place of, of fear, falling before God and being like, God could never accept me. And so we end up actually turning God into a set of rules that we have to outdo one another in order to get to heaven instead of actually accepting his grace found for us on the cross. So we started off with this question, the question of where is your confidence? But now we're asking, who is your God? You know, and these are all good questions, and I think important questions, questions that we should be asking ourselves. But they're easy to answer in a vacuum. You know, and we even mentioned that in this psalm, David is facing some things. He's facing some hard things, no doubt. But in it, he's got this, this boldness, this confidence. He, he's feeling good about himself. He's like, yeah, God with me. What do I need to be afraid of? But what happens when your confidence gets shaken? What happens when you find yourself and you're back against the wall? Where you, maybe you, you don't know the next step. Maybe you're entering into something new and you haven't seen God come through in that way yet. In those moments where your confidence is shaken, what happens? And this gets us to our third itinerary inventory question. It is how strong are the foundations of your life? How strong are, your fund, are the foundations of your life? And you see, in, in this psalm, in verse 7, we get this dramatic shift. Because David goes from this boldness, 
this confidence realm, this confidence idea, and all of a sudden, he completely shifts. And I don't know if this is a different moment. I mean, it might be the same moment. I don't know. But David, all of a sudden, is now, he's freaking out. And he doesn't know if God's going to come through. And this is what it says in verse 9. It says, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. There's a deep sense of agony and pain in this verse. There's a deep sense of pain, and yet still, still David says, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. I've maybe never been down this road before, but i got to have confidence in God. i got to hope in him. i got to rely on him. I don't have anything else to rely on. He's my Lord. He's my stronghold. He's my salvation. He's my light. Where else am I going to turn? And David was able to do this because his foundations in, in the Lord were so strong. He was rooted in God. And though this might be something new, he was rooted in God to say, you know what? God's going to come through for me. And I'm afraid sometimes when it comes to our world that, yeah, we might have the foundation of Jesus, but we're not really rooted in it. And we end up chasing after anything and everything else. You know, students right over here, I interact with you guys a lot. Makes sense. Um, but sometimes I wonder about the goals that we have. If you guys have it on your sheet, I wrote down three goals for you. Feel free to just write those in. And once again, I realize we're at church, but I would encourage you, just be real, all right? Don't be like, oh yeah, I want to read more, I want to pray more. If that's true, awesome. But if you're like, hey, you know what, I want to finish school. Maybe I want to buy a house. Maybe I want to get a car. Maybe, I, I don't know. But just write down those goals. So I heard you guys take a second, write those down. But students, getting back to you guys, sometimes I worry about our goals because it feels like sometimes we exchange our goals for God's. And our goals become everything that we're concerned with and everything that we care about. So my question for you guys in particular is what are we living for? What are we living for? What are we aiming at? What are we basing our life on? What, what are we building our life upon? And you know, I know this isn't new because I talk to you guys to feel like about this decent amount, decent amount. But just the idea that, you know, high school isn't going to last forever. Some of you are like, amen, praise, let's do it. It's not. But if it's not, why in the world would we give our whole entire life to it? Now, I'm not saying don't go after good grades. Go after good grades. I'm not saying don't try to be the best swimmer or the best runner or the best in drama. I, I don't know. Go after those things. Those are good goals. But don't let your goals become God's. And adults, lest we think we don't do the exact same thing, how often in our world do we exchange kind of goals and things that we know God wants us to go after, and we exchange them just for earthly goals? Do we exchange them for hopes of wealth, recognition, status, influence, power, comfortability? Not realizing that, you know, at the end there's going to be a life. And we're going to have to give account for everything that we did here in this world. And we are going to have to give an account. We're going to get up to heaven and Jesus is going to ask, hey, what did you do with the life I gave you? And 1 Corinthians 3 actually talks about this. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, it says this. It says, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. We will reveal with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So church, what type of building materials are, are we building upon the foundation on our lives? What, what type of things are we doing? And I wonder if maybe we have these goals, and I'm not saying they're bad goals. I feel like probably a lot of our goals are good goals. But I wonder if God's saying, hey, you know what? I want you actually, I want you to, to submit those goals to me, because I might have different goals for you than you have goals for you. And, you know, and I wonder if maybe God's saying, hey, you know what? 
I want you to focus more on eternal things, more on kingdom-minded things, than on things of this earth, than on temporal things. I wonder if God's saying, hey, you know what? Maybe I want you to give up a little bit of your comfortability so you might suffer so that people might get to know me. I wonder if maybe, like the rich young ruler, God's challenging us, hey, right now, you are way too reliant on your wealth, and I'm asking you to actually give up some of that, that you might look more like me and follow me. Maybe it's, hey, I need to leave my mother and father for the sake of Jesus. That's a challenge. And I see this one a lot. Are we willing to forgive? Are we willing to actually seek reconciliation when everything in us instead wants to run the other way and wants to burn someone out of our lives? Are we willing to actually be more like Jesus in that? And I wonder if God's challenging us in that. In our world in 2023, are we willing to be less productive that we might actually be more like Jesus? You know, as a student leadership team, we've been kind of going through questions like this, in particular that last one. We've been reading this book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I know uh, Pastor Ted kind of mentioned it a couple weeks ago, but I think this quote also kind of fits our context and fits this message. And I think it's, I think it's revealing. It says this, it says, Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. Well, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And could it be that in this world where we think we have to have our skis on and we have to be going down black diamond out of control, that God's saying, hey, stop striving. Hey, stop trying to earn it your way. Stop trying to find your identity in what you do. Find your identity in me. Find your hope in me. Put your confidence in me. I'm not going to let you down. Despite what the world may do, I'm not going to let you down. Because here's the thing, guys. I don't want to be a functional atheist that says, yes, I believe in God. Yes, I trust in him, but daily I don't really live like it. I don't want to be on top of the skis living a reckless and chaotic life. And I don't want to build things in my world and in my life that really don't really last. Let's just be honest, if we are building things that aren't based on God, it's got a shelf life. It's only going to last so long. You know, I, I say I don't want to build those things, but to be honest, sometimes I do. Um, and earlier this summer, uh, we, in, the, in June, July, we end up doing our performance reviews um, just as a, as a church staff. Uh, and so I met with Ted. Don't worry, I did great. So there you go. Um... <laughs> But I had an idea for Ted, and my idea was, I was like, hey, Ted, I want to be a bus driver on the side. And he's like, okay, explain. Um, and I said, hey, I can, I can meet with more students. I can build stronger relationships. I had all these good reasons. Um, and I was like, it's going to be fantastic. I'm like, I can get more in the community. I also had some other rationale where I was like, I want to make more money. Let's just be real. Um, and I was like, I could do that. I could maybe buy a house. I was like, maybe I could also impress a lady. I don't know. Um, just being real, guys. Just being real. That's what's happening. But as I began to continually kind of think about it and dwell upon it, I think this idea kind of came to me that if I do this, yes, it's, it's a good goal, but it's going to keep me from what should be my ultimate goal, and that's being a disciple of Jesus. That I'm going to add a whole bunch of hurry to my life. And is that hurry going to keep me from actually the best goal of being more like Jesus? And it might be something that maybe later on I feel like, oh, I can handle this. But for right now, I was just like, this is going to prevent me from being more like Jesus. You know, David was confident. He had confidence amidst, amidst fear and doubt because he had strong foundations rooted in God. Who he was was rooted in God. And would we be able to say in the things that we go after and the things that we want in this life, would we be able to say that we have that same type of confidence? Or would we say that our faith is so shallow 
that it ends up actually looking more like the houses of sand in Matthew 7, that when the winds and the waves come, they end up just crashing it right over. I want to have that confidence, that David-like confidence. And so David, he, he ends a psalm like this. And if I can invite the band back out here. He ends a psalm like this. He says, I remain confident of this. This is verse 13. That I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. And wait for the Lord. The solution to fear, the solution to the unknown, the, the, the solution to not knowing what to do next is waiting. And I know sometimes that's the last thing we want to do. But it's waiting. And it's waiting and knowing that the Lord is good. But it's not just, just waiting for the sake of just waiting. I want you to look at those two terms. It says, be strong and take heart. These are preparatory type phrases. These are phrases that the Israelites use before going into battle or crossing the Jordan. And they're preparatory because here's the thing, guys. God is on the move. And here's the thing. I don't know what you're going through, but what I do know is that God cares and that God knows. And here's the other thing is that God does not leave his children. And that God cares about his people. And he is not in the habit of abandoning his sons and his daughters. That that's the God we serve, a God that is near, a God that is close, and a God that we can have confidence in because he's shown up again, 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 and again. And it's based in who he is. We can have confidence in that. So guys, today, let's be strong and take heart. Let's wait on the Lord. Let's be confident because we serve the God that we serve the King of Kings. And if He's with us, nothing can stand against us. All right, let's pray it up. All right, dear God, Lord, I thank you, the God that you are near. God, that we can have confidence in you. God, that you don't leave your people. And God, I don't know what everyone's going, going through in this. I don't know what wars, what battles, what things are being said, whether it be personal or maybe not personal, what money problems we might be facing. But Lord, what I do know, God, is that you aren't in the habit of leaving your people. Lord, you don't abandon us. So God, despite what everything in our life that might say, hey, rely on yourself, God, I pray that we be a people that first rely on you, that first turn to you. God, we don't want to be functional atheists. We want to be people of God. And when people see us, they say, there's something different about them. It's because God is with us. He is close. And because of that, we can have peace. We can have hope. Because we know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. May we have confidence in him. In your name, amen. So guys, we're going to get back here to worship, um, but right now I just want to open up uh, just for tithes and offerings. You'll see some information here on the, on the back slides, and if you maybe have a physical gift, we have a couple black boxes there in the back. Feel free to throw those in there. But let's actually sing out with confidence. Let's actually yell out with pride to say, hey, we serve the God of gods. We serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And if he's with us, what in the world can stand against us? Let's praise his name.
have a student leader like Brad Janiszewski. Thank you, Brad, for your word. Have a seat, everybody. Have a seat. 
Uh, we're going to have a conversation uh, with Kim Shepson, our children's director, just to ease your concerns right now. Kim is not going anywhere, okay? All of you are like, oh gosh, who's leaving now? Kim's not going anywhere, but uh, Kim's been on a journey that we want to bring you into. Uh, as we know, the Shepson family, we love them so much. And one thing of the many things we know about Doug and Kim Shepson is they listen to God. They seek God and they listen to the leading of the Spirit in their life. And so we want to bring you into a storyline that Kim's been on with her husband and family and kind of talk about the implications of that for Eagle. So Kim, bring us in. Well, for the last year, the Lord has been stirring some things in my heart. And as I've been laying it before him and listening, just asking, um, where is he taking us on this journey? And so some of the things that have been really strong and evident one is how much I love Eagle. I love all the people of Eagle, the families and the kids, and that couldn't be more clear. I love doing ministry here um, and being part of the family. Also with that, I've also had the stirring in my heart that I really miss teaching, and it's part of how God has wired me to enjoy studying, to enjoy teaching Bible studies on a regular basis, um, and that's something that I haven't been able to do as regularly with the role that I'm in. With that, my family has a full season of life, and it's one of those things that I'd love to be more available to them right now, um, just during this season. So these little pieces were kind of stirring in my heart, and along with that, I've also had more women talking about Bible studies, and if there could be a more formal ministry where we could connect and um, have avenues just to show care and um, really dig into scripture together. And so Kind of with the Lord kind of stirring all that up, I proposed a more formal ministry at Eagle um, to Pastor Eric and Pastor Ted and the elders of having a women's ministry and what would that look like if I were to move into that position and we can more formally do that um, as a church and to establish some things. And they have been extremely supportive in um, what that might look like. And so just wanted to share with you how God was leading, but also to say for our Eagle Kids families, as there will be a transition sometimes in the future, um, I just want you to know how much I love, love, love your kids. And so while my role formally might change with them, my relationship will not. Um, I love those kids. I want to hear how they're doing. I want to talk to them. And um, all those things will continue. And I feel like during the pandemic, I learned that some of the pieces that are most important in discipleship for kids are the, is the family. It's having a healthy family, healthy parents. And so being able to minister to moms who have kids and to women in general, whatever stage of life, is also kind of filtering down to a good discipleship for our kids. It's part of the goal. So church, we want to introduce you to our new director of women's ministry, Kim Shepson. <laughs> How's that? For... Thanks. We're super excited. Thank you. This is the first time in our 30 years as a church that we have a staff position called Director of Women's Ministry. I think it's long overdue. I know ladies are saying amen and amen. Men, I think we would agree, long overdue, a really important ministry. As you know, Kim, she's already investing deeply in so many women's lives. Some of you in the room have been on the direct receiving end of Kim's ministry in that way. And she'd like to give a more focused effort and energy around that. We are fully supporting and embracing that. And so we're in a transition now, right? So the, the dominoes that come from this is we want to celebrate this step in Kim's life. We want to be fully behind the Shepson family. And we want to embrace women's ministry and its future. It's going to be some neat things. Kim will be on stage in the future sharing more about, right, lots of cool things in your heart as you think about ways to invest deeply in women. And um, so those are things to come. What we have now in front of us is we have a transition in our Eagle Kids director. For four plus years, Kim Shepson has been leading Eagle Kids. And I use the analogy many times with her and with others. This is a bit like replacing Peyton Manning in the quarterback position, okay? Hopefully we'll handle it slightly better than the other organization at the moment has been, right? So, But, you know, we've had a situation where Kim has been leading so well and so strong for these four years that we're in an active search now to try to find someone to replace her and all the good work she's doing. The, the role itself, as you might imagine, is multifaceted. There's a lot of elements to Kim's job. You know, it's a bit like a principal of a school. She's certainly invested with the kids. She's deeply connected with parents and volunteers and family units. So we want to open this up to all of you, bring you into the 
prayer line and ask for your help. Pray. We ask for your prayers to God to send us the person he has for the Eagle Kids director. And then network. We're open and interested in who do you think we should be talking to, okay? Four plus years ago, Kim Shebson was in a blue chair. We were on stage talking about an Eagle Kids director transition, and I believe her son Josiah tapped her on the shoulder and said, Mom, you should apply. Aren't you glad Josiah did that? <laughs> we are super grateful because Josiah tapped you on the shoulder for that one. And so who knows who the Lord has for it. We've been interviewing, we've been seeking, we've been pursuing. So talk to Kim, talk to myself, talk to Pastor Ted, any of the elders. If you've got a name of someone we should be chatting with. Kim, maybe mention a couple of things just about timing of transition and kind of how you see the things playing out here. Well, I think um, I want to make sure that Eagle Kids is in good hands. So I will be part of the transition on making that happen. And I know the Lord is going to provide the right person at the right time. And so the kids programs will continue. We have a great support staff who are in place and we'll just keep keep ministering to the kids and we'll wait on the Lord to see what he does. Say a couple words about your staff that's around you. And we had conversation oh with goodness. Natalie and Lisa. Just let everyone know we did have a heart to heart with Natalie. She's amazing. And so fill them in on that. Natalie McLean is downstairs doing an amazing job. And I think you guys know she is wonderful. Um, she was the first person we approached and offered the position to. She is, um, she's capable. She has a heart for the kids. She really wants to finish school. And that is how God is leading her. Lisa Shively will continue to be a support staff coming in um, as she does during the year and helping out. So uh, we are still a team who is here, but I just want you to know that Natalie is amazing and she was the first person that we went to and it's not where God is leading her at this time. Yeah, it was kind of like my Andrew Luck scenario, okay? I was going Peyton Manning to Andrew Luck. I was going Kim to Natalie with this. And then Andrew says, I need some more time to finish my master's degree. It's basically how the conversation went. We're fully supporting Natalie. She's finishing her Master of Divinity. We're behind you, Natalie and Cam. So grateful for your involvement. But the capacity that she has available doesn't align with the need and the scope of the responsibility of this job right now in the season of life. Are you with me in that? So God's got somebody. We don't know their name yet. But we're trusting in his time and his way, he's going to have someone to step into the Eagle Kids director position and tell them Kim will help be in this spot, help us with the transition. A really cool thing, whoever God does bring, Kim's going to be on staff to help mentor and develop the transition of this person. What a gift that's going to be. To have an office right beside Kim, I mean, that's gold. To have right next door neighbor to be able to say, hey, hey, Kim, help me think about this or what do we do with this situation? So I think we're set up really well for Eagle Kids to not just survive, but thrive and flourish in the next chapter. I think Kim's done a great job of building her team. I think we've got the components. God's going to bring us a leader and not just help us maintain what we have, but grow and develop it to the next stage of where God wants to take it. I think we're positioned for that. And I hope you can celebrate with me that this is the sign of a healthy staff environment when we can maintain and retain a quality individual like Kim Shebson and her family on a staff position. We just want to help our staff be able to grow and develop. And she's growing and developing, and she wants to step into some new space. We work together. I think we all win in the end that way. Would you agree with me? Yeah. Anything else you want to say? I want to pray now for Kim and Shebson family and for this search, and then uh, we'll move into benediction here. Jesus, thank you so much for Kim and Doug and the Shebson family. I just think of all the hours, all the stuff they do that no one knows about, all the things behind the scenes. Thank you for bringing them here. Thank you for four plus years of their investment in kids and families. Thank you for how much the ministry has grown. Uh, so many in this room, so many listening online just are on the direct receiving end of their selfless and sacrificial efforts. And so from the depths of our hearts, we say thank you. And we pray the fullness of your blessing on Kim as she steps into this new women's director role. We pray that it would be multiplied fruit, that it'd be Ephesians 3, immeasurably more than all we could have ever asked, hoped, dreamed, or imagined in that space. We thank you for the heart you've given her. We thank you for the gifts and talents. And we just thank you for what you're going to do in our women's ministry area through her leadership. And now, Lord, we trust you, as we have many times for 30-plus years. God, would you send us the right person for this Eagle Kids director's position, right time, right person, right circumstances. We trust you for it. And just like Brad's message, our confidence will be in you, and we will wait upon you. We will look to you. We will seek you. 
And we thank you for all the wonderful children and families, all these great volunteers who serve in Eagle Kids. We thank you for the ministry you've given us to the next generation. May this be another step in its flourishing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Round of applause for Kim and Shepson family. Thank you, Kim. All right, let's stand, everybody. Got a few things to draw your attention to before we uh, get to the benediction. We've got a big summer splash party planned on Thursday night. So one last summer splash is what it's called. What does that mean? We opened the Lebanon Water Park free to any of you and your friends. That's right. No strings attached. It's free. 6.30 Thursday night. Bring your kiddos. Bring your kids' friends. Bring your neighbors. Bring whoever you want to bring. And it's just going to be a great evening, Thursday night, this Thursday, 6.30, show up, have a good time, meet some folks. And then Friday night, 7 o'clock down the multi-purpose room, Tom Langibartle is going to be leading a prayer gathering for the Muslim world. So join us Friday night, 7 o'clock down the multi-purpose room, Tom will be leading that. A couple of weeks out, we've got our first worship night planned with John Solomon and his leadership. How grateful are you for the Solomon family coming and joining us? Our new worship pastor, have you even got to meet John and Whitney and their family? So Solomon's have on their heart to continue to develop our worship ministry. And one of the things we've been talking about is worship nights and kind of worship and prayer nights. And so the first one's going to be Sunday, August 6th, 6 p.m. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus that night around launching our kids into the next school year. We're going to pray over our children. We're going to pray over our students. We're going to pray over our teachers. We're going to pray over parents because it's such an important time. Some of you students are already starting before then, but many of you will be launching into your classes that week, college students as well as high school students. So come on out, parents. Plan on August 6th. Come hang with us. We're going to worship. We're going to pray, and we're going to send our kids into this next school year. And then lastly, on August 22nd, Tuesday night, We've got two discipleship classes firing up on August 22nd. Alpha Marriage with Stephen and Carrie Smith. So it's a marriage development ministry. Great fruits come forth from that. You've heard about it. They're going to be leading it again. So can't speak highly enough. If you're in a space where you've been married 30 years, you've been married for three months, jump into Alpha Marriage. It'll be a great investment. And then simultaneous on Tuesday nights, Ted will be leading a class called Spiritual Disciplines Practicing the Presence covering things like prayer, fasting, silence, solitude, all those things. Those will be two great classes. Child care will be provided. Great discipleship opportunity on August 22nd for the next several weeks after that. All right, sound good? If you're new here, so great to have you here. There's a kiosk on the way out. It's called Guest Central. Pick up a gift bag. They'll give you some free stuff there. And come on back next week. We will be in a message. I'll be speaking next week on a theme around the followership. This whole month's been about followership. And we're going to be in Psalm 56, and I'm going to be talking about followership tears. Because as we devote ourselves to being a praying people, we will be quickly encountering the space of shedding tears together in our prayers. I want to talk about that. So I want to send you out today, 2 Corinthians 4 is a benediction. Paul says this, fix your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal. And so church, go today with the eye of faith to see into what you can't see, that God would become so big in your eyes that he would right-size the circumstances before you, that he would have the perspective of eternity on your current reality. So go as a people with eternal eyes today in his name. Amen.